Patient C is a 35-year-old female that presents for a routine restorative appointment. She became your patient two years ago when she moved to the area to begin teaching at a local university. Upon moving to the Ohio Valley, she began to experience seasonal allergies and asthma. She is currently prescribed the corticosteroid Flonase, two sprays per day, and albuterol as needed. She takes over-the-counter Allegra, primarily during the spring, to treat any remaining symptoms. Patient C had her tonsils removed at the age of five due to recurrent strep infections. She also suffered from an episode of acute pancreatitis at the age of 16, but has learned to manage her symptoms through a strict diet and restriction of fats. Her dental record has been impeccable, and she has regularly scheduled dental cleanings with your office. At her last appointment, she had her first cavity and received a small composite filling on tooth number four. At her six month follow-up, she had an additional cavity diagnosed and has returned today for routine restoration on tooth number 12. The patient is injected with 2% lidocaine with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine using an MSA block for local infiltration anesthesia. Shortly after injection, you notice the patient vigorously scratching her arm. You inquire if everything is okay, and she replies, I feel funny, and my heart is racing with wheezing, gasping breaths. You must act quickly. What do you think has happened to your patient? A, she is experiencing an acute asthma attack due to dental phobia. B, she is suffering a severe allergic reaction with anaphylaxis. Or C, she is experiencing a pain response to the injection. The patient is exhibiting signs and symptoms related to the cutaneous, respiratory, and cardiovascular systems. Thus, it should be assumed that she is having an allergic reaction to the injection. Systemic anaphylactic reactions are extremely life-threatening and may be the most acute emergency encountered in dental practice. Although allergic reactions to modern anesthetics are rare, patients with a history of asthma and allergies may be genetically predisposed to have hyperactive immune responses. However, you might wonder why patient C did not have an allergic reaction during her last visit when she was initially exposed to the same anesthetic. Most substances in the body have specific markers on their surface, such as glycoproteins, that serve as a chemical name tag for recognition. These name tags are called antigens and allow the immune system to recognize which substances are supposed to be part of the body and which substances are foreign that need to be eliminated. During patient C's last visit, when the anesthetic entered her body, the antigens for the anesthetic were recognized as foreign by her immune system. The immune system became activated and began to produce antibodies that could specifically detect the anesthetic. Today, when the second exposure to the antigen occurred, her immune system was primed and ready. The foreign antigens were recognized by the antibodies. This initiated a reaction in which mast cells in the body release chemicals such as histamine. Histamine then initiates an inflammatory reaction, thus causing the anaphylactic reaction. The widespread inflammation causes a large variety of detrimental effects throughout the body, with the main concerns being smooth muscle constriction in the airway of the lungs and a sudden loss of blood pressure. For today's video, we will be focusing on the cardiovascular effects of an anaphylactic reaction. In order to understand the role of anaphylaxis on the vasculature, we must first review the concept of starling fluid flux in a healthy individual. Here we see a capillary in the body. With the arteriolar end of the capillary on the left and the venular end of the capillary on the right. 
The wall of the capillary is comprised of endothelial cells, shown here as black dashes. In between the endothelial cells are clefts that allow the movement of water and other small molecular weight molecules between the cells. Filtration is the net movement of water and dissolved solutes from the plasma body fluid compartment into the interstitial fluid. Reabsorption is defined as the net movement of water and dissolved solutes from the interstitial fluid into the plasma. Fluids are constantly being filtered between the endothelial cell clefts at the arteriolar end of the capillary and most of the filtered fluid is then reabsorbed at the venular end of the capillary. This occurs in response to the balance between four main pressures. This concept in physiology is known as the Starling fluid flux. The first pressure is called the blood hydrostatic pressure. This is the pressure generated by the heart pumping blood into the enclosed space of the blood vessels. Blood hydrostatic pressure is the main pressure promoting filtration across the capillary wall. There is also a pressure called the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, or IFHP, which is sometimes referred to as a back pressure. It is due to the hydrostatic pressure of fluids from the interstitial fluid into the plasma. Under normal physiological conditions, this pressure should be negligible and is thus represented here by a smaller arrow. However, in some pathological conditions, it may become significant. Osmotically active proteins are compartmentalized within the blood and these proteins act as sponges, pulling water towards them. The proteins in the plasma compartment establish a pressure called the blood colloid osmotic pressure, or BCOP, which is also referred to as the oncotic pressure. The blood colloid osmotic pressure is the main pressure promoting reabsorption in the capillaries. Under normal conditions, the endothelial cell clefts are too small to allow the proteins to escape from the plasma compartment. This is represented by an index called the reflection coefficient. A reflection coefficient of zero means that a substance is freely permeable to the barrier, while a reflection coefficient of 1 means that a substance is unable to pass through the barrier. Proteins typically have a reflection coefficient close to 1, meaning that they cannot pass through the endothelial cell clefts. If proteins did escape into the interstitium, this would create an interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure. Since proteins are usually not able to escape the capillary wall under normal physiological conditions, this pressure should typically be low to negligible. Using your knowledge of Starling fluid flux, which of the following pressures would be most likely to increase in a patient with a severe anaphylactic reaction? A, the blood colloid osmotic pressure, B, the blood hydrostatic pressure, C, the blood oncotic pressure, D, the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure, or E, the mean arterial blood pressure. The correct answer is D, the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure. Let's examine the impact that a severe anaphylactic reaction would have on Starling fluid flux. On the left, we see a normal healthy individual in which the plasma proteins are retained in the plasma compartment. During an anaphylactic reaction, shown on the right, vasodilators such as histamine are released. Arterioles throughout the systemic circulation would dilate, increasing blood flow through the capillaries. Additionally, these chemicals cause a widening of the endothelial cell clefts. This decreases the reflection coefficient for proteins and allows plasma proteins to escape into the interstitial fluid. Since the proteins are no longer in the plasma, during anaphylaxis, the blood colloid osmotic pressure drops significantly, 
and the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure increases. Water is osmotically attracted to the proteins in the interstitial space, causing a sudden translocation of fluids from within the capillaries into the interstitial fluid. The swelling of the interstitial space is called edema. Additionally, the vasodilation of upstream arterioles exacerbates these effects by allowing larger amounts of fluid to pass into the capillaries, across the capillary walls, and into the interstitial fluid. While the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure was minimal under normal conditions, in anaphylaxis, the IFHP will increase due to the edema. Furthermore, during anaphylaxis, the blood hydrostatic pressures will plummet if fluid continues to leave the vasculature. If we examine an overall picture of the fluid flux, we would see that in normal conditions, most of the filtered fluid, around 85%, is reabsorbed at the venular end of the capillaries. During anaphylaxis, the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure increases drastically due to the leakage of plasma proteins into the interstitial space. A large amount of filtration occurs and very little reabsorption occurs. This causes edema of the interstitial space. Furthermore, these effects lead to a substantial drop in arterial blood pressures, which can lead to anaphylactic shock and potentially death without appropriate treatment. Now that you have a better understanding of the alterations in starling fluid flux during anaphylactic shock, let's try to answer the following multiple choice question. During an anaphylactic reaction, A, the reflection coefficient for proteins in the systemic vasculature is increased from 0 to 1, B, the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure is increased due to the presence of additional proteins in the interstitial fluid. C. The blood colloid osmotic pressure is increased due to the vasodilation of systemic arterioles. D. The systemic mean arterial blood pressure increases drastically, leading to an increase in the heart rate. Or E. The blood hydrostatic pressure would be increased due to systemic arteriolar vasoconstriction. Did you choose B? If so, nice work. For response A, the release of histamine and other inflammatory chemicals would reduce the reflection coefficient from its normal value of 1. For response C, the systemic arterioles do vasodilate during anaphylaxis, but the blood colloid osmotic pressure should be decreased due to the escape of proteins from the plasma compartment. For response D, a patient in anaphylaxis would experience a large drop in the mean arterial blood pressure due to the loss of fluids into the interstitial space. The heart rate, however, would most likely be increased in an attempt to bring the blood pressure up to normal values. For response E, the systemic arterioles would vasodilate during the anaphylactic reaction. Blood hydrostatic pressure would also be decreased due to the loss of plasma fluids into the interstitium. It is critical that a patient suffering from an anaphylactic reaction be treated promptly. Generally, the more rapidly that signs and symptoms appear following exposure to the antigen, the more intense the ultimate reaction will be. The reaction typically reaches its maximal intensity within 5 to 30 minutes, but death can occur within a few minutes. Emergency personnel should be summoned and basic life support may have to be administered. The most common treatment for acute anaphylaxis is an epinephrine autoinjector, commonly referred to as an EpiPen, which is administered in the muscle of the outer thigh. Epinephrine acts as a potent vasoconstrictor for the systemic arterioles and also acts as a bronchodilator. Thus, it directly opposes the effects of histamine in the anaphylactic reaction. 
In severe cases, the patient would most likely have to receive additional support through hospitalization and fluid replacement. Hopefully this video has helped to reinforce the physiological basis for anaphylactic shock. Systemic anaphylactic reactions are extremely life-threatening and may be the most acute emergency encountered in dental practice. Thank you for your assistance in solving this case.